Hello, and welcome to English Through History. Um, previously, we looked at the history of an iconic American food, the hamburger. Well, today we're going to take a look at another uh, very well-known symbol of American pop culture, the superhero. Um, now, if you've seen my fantastic interview on uh, the history of the hamburger, uh, you might recall that the hamburger, while you know, ultimately finding its form in America, uh, has its roots in Europe, uh, specifically Hamburg, Germany. And that's the case with superheroes as well. Uh, although, um, you know, superheroes, you know, we think of, you know, Superman and Batman, which are all American uh, products of America, uh, the idea of the superhero, its background stems from Europe. And one could actually argue that uh, the superhero is really a British uh, invention. So, but we'll talk about all of that later. Uh, anyway, let's go ahead and get started. So, first of all, the idea of uh, heroes with superhuman powers is really as old as humanity itself. Uh, you know, most fans of the series are probably familiar with the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, which is one of the earliest recorded works of fiction. And it tells the story of its eponymous half-god hero who fights gods, monsters, uh, and giants in, in his quest to conquer death. Uh, and, and all throughout history and all throughout the world, we see characters like this. We have, uh, you know, Heracles in ancient Greece, uh, Sun Wukong from Asia, Maui from Polynesia, and so on. Uh, likewise, the idea of stories uh, told through a series of pictures is also quite ancient. Uh, you know, it, simply hearing the phrase uh, ancient Egypt is likely to bring to mind images, uh, you know, of, of tomb walls with various, uh, you know, animal-headed gods, you know, in, in, in different poses and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, and similarly, uh, in medieval times, we have the, the famous bio tapestry, which is sort of a pictorial telling uh, or history of the Battle of Hastings, right? Uh, and furthermore, the concept of vigilantes and crime fighters, that's also fairly old too, as stories of Robin Hood or the Korean folk hero Hong Gil Dong uh, will demonstrate. Uh, but it wasn't until the 1800s that, that all of these things started to come together and eventually reach their end point uh, in the creation of comic book superheroes in the early 1900s. Okay, now, uh, this history has a lot of different parts, and it's going to be confusing. At first, you might not see how all of these parts fit together, uh, but don't worry. We'll, we'll kind of do a bit of a summary at the end and try to synthesize these various parts. So hang in there. Uh, by the way, uh, this also has a little bit of French pronunciation. Uh, I know really nothing about French, so <laughs> I'm going to try my best here. Francophiles, please try not to be offended by my butchery of <laughs> the French language. All right, so let's get started. Um, now, uh, our story begins in Scotland in 1826. Now, at this time, there was a magazine called the Glasgow Looking Glass. Uh, now, the Looking Glass was notable because it was the first publication to make uh, heavy use of comics and illustrations, uh, usually for the purpose of political satire. Now, later in 1837, uh, a Swiss artist <clears throat> named Rudolf Topfer created what could maybe be described as the first graphic novel. Uh, <clears throat> it was originally called, here we go, the uh, uh, Histoire de... Monsieur Vieux-Bois, <laughs> but it was published in the USA as The Adventures of Obadiah Oldbuck. Um, it's actually available to read online, uh, I think through Yale, uh, uh, Yale's uh, online library. Uh, it's actually kind of funny and entertaining. I have not read the whole thing, but um, it reminds me a lot of Don Quixote. It, it tells the story uh, of an aristocrat who goes, goes on all kinds of adventures 
for the sake of, of a woman that he's courting. Um, all right, now, meanwhile, um, at this time, uh, especially in, in America, uh, a lot of adventure-oriented literature was becoming really popular. Uh, authors such as Jules Verne, H. Ryder Haggard, uh, Alexander Dumas, Robert Louis Stevenson, and others had really ignited the public's interest in uh, fantastic adventures. Uh, now, in 1896, the first issue of the magazine Argosy was published. Uh, now, Argosy is what is known as a pulp magazine. Uh, these, uh, they were story magazines that were printed on cheap paper, a pulpy paper, hence the name. Uh, and they usually contained a variety of short adventure or horror stories or that sort of thing. Uh, if you're familiar with the works of H.P. Lovecraft or Robert E. Howard, those were originally published in The Pulse. Uh, anyway, this is noteworthy because it created a very fertile environment for stories of fantastic adventure. Now, let's go back to the UK. Um, around 1903, a woman named Baroness Orgzy and her husband, Montague Barstow, wrote a novel called The Scarlet Pimpernel. Uh, now, this was a story of a masked vigilante who sought to defend uh, French aristocrats from, be from being sent to the guillotine. Uh, during the day, the Scarlet Pimpernel has the, identi the identity of a sort of foolish, and wealthy noble in order to hide his true identity. Hmm. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> it should. Uh, all right, so back to the pulps. Now, in 1912, Edgar Rice Burroughs, uh, who, now that's the creator of Tarzan, not to be confused with William S. Burroughs, who wrote Naked Lunch and is responsible for the name of the band Steely Dan, Look that one up. We can't talk about it here. Uh, anyway, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, he wrote uh, A Princess of Mars. Uh, this was about a hero named John Carter. And in it, uh, John Carter is a man from Earth who discovers that he has super strength and agility while on the planet of Mars. Uh, this is, to my knowledge, the first adventure story where the hero actually has superhuman abilities. Okay, now meanwhile, uh, an author named Franker, uh, Frank L. Packard uh, wrote The Adventures of Jimmy Dale, and this was about a wealthy playboy who at night puts on a mask and calls himself the Gray Seal. Seal in this case uh, meaning like a symbol, not, you know, our, our, our you know, uh, aquatic mammal clapping for fish, not not that one, uh, but uh, the gray seal, uh, who is a uh, who, who kind of a thief who breaks into safes and vaults and later gets involved using his skills to stop criminals. Uh, how much of this was inspired by the Scarlet Pimpernel? Um, I, I don't really know. It's possible that the Scarlet Pimpernel inspired uh, uh, the Adventures of Jimmy Dale. But it might also be that uh, it was just pure coincidence. Uh, now, uh, one character that does definitely seem influenced by the Scarlet Pimpernel is Zorro. Uh, Zorro was created for pulp magazines in 1919. Um, and, and, you know, I don't think we need to go into a whole lot of detail about Zorro. He's very famous. You don't need me to tell you about that. Uh, however, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here. Uh, back in 1916, there was a French film series. Uh, now, keep in mind, this was before television, so any sort of series had to be on film. Uh, it was created by, here we go again, uh, Louis uh, Fouillade and Arthur Bernadet, and it was called uh, Judex. Uh, now, this was about a man who dresses in a hat and a cape, has a secret lair, and seeks revenge on a villain for the death of his father. <laughs> now that sounds familiar too. Uh, by the way, uh, this film was later remade in 1963 as well. So if you uh, look for information on Judex screenshots or whatever, you might come up with two different results, all right? All right, so let's take a second now and, and sort of 
uh, summarize and regroup. So at this point, we have three things happening here. We've got the, popular, the popularity of comics, which was spurred by the Glasgow Looking Glass and the Adventures of Obadiah Old Book. Uh, 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 and um, for those of you uh, familiar with the history of comics, of course, in America, there was the Yellow Kid and all that sort of thing as well. But then we also have the concept of masked crime fighters uh, popularized by the Scarlet Pimpernel. And then we have the, uh, the, the popularity of adventure stories as well uh, due to you know, various authors and pulp magazines. Now, with the advent of Zorro, we see two of these uh, adventure stories and you know, masked vigilantes like the Scarlet Pimpernel coming together. So the only part that we're missing now is to put those in comic form. And around this time, too, uh, adventure comics were becoming more popular. We're, we're seeing them go from, you know, kind of humorous cartoons to more adventure-style ones, such as uh, the, uh, the Tintin versions, or I believe in, in uh, its native French is pronounced Tintin by the, uh, by the author. Oh, boy, this is a tough one. Well, I'm just going to say Herge. I know I'm not pronouncing that right. Uh, but anyway, there you go. Okay, moving on. So now here we have the emergence of a fairly iconic superhero, The Shadow. Uh, in 1930, a pulp magazine called Detective Story created a series of radio shows that were uh, voiced by a character that they called The Shadow. Now, this narrator uh, became sort of a mascot for the magazine and became so well known that... Um, uh, Street and Smith, the, the publisher of Detective Story, uh, along uh, they teamed up with the writer William B. Gibson and they created its own magazine dedicated to the shadow. And later this character became uh, uh, the hero of a radio series. Um, now, although the shadow is considered one of the first superheroes, of course, he's predated by Judex, Zorro, and the Scarlet Pimpernel. So this was really nothing new. Uh, it was pretty much the packaging of old wine in, uh, well, an old bottle. <laughs> but uh, what is noteworthy, though, is that the Shadow did have a superpower, uh, specifically the ability to uh, kind of make himself invisible. All right. Now, also noteworthy uh, in 1930 was a book by uh, Philip Wiley called The Gladiator. Now, this is a novel about uh, a scientist who uses a special serum to give his son super strength and immunity to bullets. And if you think that's basically Superman, well, others have so have thought so too, including, I believe, uh, Wiley himself. Uh, but um, there doesn't really seem to be any definite proof that Superman was inspired by Gladiator. The creators have actually denied that, and they've been pretty forthcoming about their inspirations. So, again, I think this was just kind of a coincidence. Uh, now, speaking of coincidences, uh, some of you are probably wondering if or when I'm going to mention Japanese manga. Uh, you know, after all, the, the similarities between manga and comic books is undeniable. Uh, however, in as far as I know, it seems to me that manga and comic books, this was kind of an instance of, of parallel uh, evolution that happened, you know, something similar that happened in the same time uh, in two totally different cultures. Um, you know, Japan has always had a very kind of rich history of uh, illustrated, uh, you know, stories and artwork, and I think it just naturally evolved out of that. Uh, but it is worth pointing out that around this time in Japan, there was the emergence of a hero known as uh, Ogo, Ogon Bato, or uh, Ogon Bat, as he, or the Golden Bat, as he's sometimes called. Uh, this was created by Suzuki Ichiro and Takeo Nagamatsu. I'm a little bit better at Japanese pronunciation than French, but not much better. Uh, anyway, the Golden Bat was uh, a skull-faced, cape-wearing, evil-fighting hero uh, who originated from a storytelling method known as kamishibai, uh, where traveling entertainers 
would display and narrate illustrations before an audience. Again, th this was before television, keep in mind. All right, so uh, now in 1931, the detective comic strip Dick Tracy was published. So here we see a, an even closer tie between uh, you know, adventure stories and comics. And then in 1934, something very special happened. This is when Lee Falk published his first comic strip starring Mandrake the Magician. Now, uh, Falk was inspired by magicians like uh, Houdini, and he created this uh, sort of globe-traveling magician who stops villains by using hypnotism and magic. Now, this was decades before Doctor Strange, by the way. Uh, so finally, here we have our first definite instance of a comic book superhero. So there you go. Okay, but, uh, you know, even though Mandrake is indeed a superhero, by my uh, metric anyway, he's a magician. And that's very different from, say, Batman or Superman. So when do we get the first idea of a mask-wearing hero in tights. Well, that also comes from Lee Falk. Uh, two years later, uh, he came up with the, uh, with the Phantom, uh, whose look inspired many other superheroes after that. Uh, the, the Phantom wore a skin-tight purple outfit, uh, had a blindfold on, and um, he also had pupilless eyes. Uh, and we see that in a lot of other superheroes. Okay, so let's go back to hamburgers for a moment. So uh, once again, if you've uh, seen our, uh, our uh, episode on that, uh, you'll know that it was White Castle that was responsible for the hamburgers current form of a meat patty between buns. But a lot of times when people think of you know, hamburgers, they think of McDonald's, right? Well, same thing. Um, you know, although Falk created the first, what we would think of comic uh, as a comic book superhero, it was two years later when, uh, inspired by all of the things that we've talked about, Jerry Siegel conceived of the idea of Superman and partnered with Joe Shuster to eventually bring their creation to action comics issue one. Uh, shortly after that, Captain Marvel, also known as Shazam, uh, made his appearance with Batman in 1939 uh, and The Flash a year after that. And then so began the next step of our popular mythology. All right, so that's a lot of information to sort through. So let's strip that down to the basics. So once again, we have three main parts that we needed for the creation of comic book superheroes. We had uh, the appearance of comics, started by the Glasgow Looking Glass. Uh, the idea of the secret identity vigilante, uh, created by Baroness Orgzy and Montague Barstow. The popularity of adventure stories, spurred by writers like Jules Verne and H. Ryder Haggard. And finally, Lee Falk, putting all of these elements together for the first time. All right. So, uh, which of these elements is the most important? Um, you know, in, in my opinion, I, I think that's probably going to be uh, the Scarlet Pimpernel. Uh, that really was kind of our, our first, you know, mask-wearing secret identity vigilante. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, I'm going to have to give the award to uh, England on this one, and not just because... Uh, the creators of this series are from England, uh, but, you know, I think really that is where we have our first truly recognizable superhero. All right, so there you go, ladies and gentlemen. From ancient Sumeria to Superman, from tomb walls to the pages of Marvel Comics, that's how superheroes have evolved over the years. Hey, if you're a big fan of superheroes, uh, here's a shameless plug for my own upcoming book, Might of the Gods, uh, you know, a, a book of superheroics dedicated to uh, learners of English as a second language or anyone who kind of struggles reading English or anyone who just wants some nice, simple adventure stories. Uh, just more about that in the, in, in the description. But other than that, I hope you found this informative. Thanks for watching, everybody.